In the year 2003, I had this project. It was called Nation of Dreams. The idea was to film people, children, grown-ups, aging people, and ask them what their dream were, were. The idea was to build a huge map of dreams so that we could see the dreams of our nation by gender, by region, by age. And by aggregating that information, we could actually have a policy-making tool, an actual policy-making tool to make people happy. That would be like the best policy ever. You know, a tool that, tell, that tells you what people want, not what the World Bank wants, not what the United Nations think they want, but what people actually want, what they dream of. So this was 2003, two years before YouTube. So we had to go out and film people. So we head out to film people. We ask a group of kids who had scholarships at an information technology institute what their dreams were. All of them, all of them, had one of three responses. They wanted to be a Java programmer, a network engineer, or a flash designer. I said, well, I get it. That's those are the scholarships we're giving them. And you know, this is a remote community. The, 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 the near the university, the closest university is like an hour away. So they're clinging to the only option they have. No problem. Then I ask a friend, can you please ask the kids in your project? This, this is a farming project. How to improve the, the productivity of the land. They were farmers. I get the videos, I'm all excited, we, you know, we plug in the, the, the DVD there, let's watch the videos, and bam! Everyone, all of them, the, you, the young, the old, the, all of them, they want to own a piece of land so they can live off the land. So, huh, okay, they're farmers. So I head up to the mountains, El Limon, southwest of Okoa, remote mountain community, and I ask the, the kids, what your dreams are. Okay, we've been working with these kids for years, building a community center, building voice over IP networks, wireless networks, internet, building their own hydroelectrical generator. It's a community that, that had been completely um, over, overlooked by the government. So I asked them, some hope. One of the girls wanted to be a soap, uh, a soap opera actress. Another one wanted to, wanted to be a singer. But then the rest of them, they all wanted to do community projects. One of them, illiterate, his dream was to build a school for kids in the mountains who had to quit school like him. And then it hit me. These kids were clinging to the only option we were giving them. And that is the danger of social intervention. By trying to help them, we were making life decisions for them. There was no lawyer, no athlete, no musician among them. There was no singer, there was no writer, there was no painter. We were deciding their lives for them. So I quit the project, I stopped everything I was doing, and I redefined my life. And that's how I became a social entrepreneur. Because I promised myself that I would never help anyone again. That I would never do such a mean thing to anyone. To take away the choices, to take away their power to be something they could be and to make decisions for them. So I decided to never help, but to always engage, enable, empower, and connect people. Flash, flash forward to 2010, January 12, 7.0 earthquake hits Port-au-Prince, Haiti. I'm next door in the Dominican Republic. The only thing I could think of that night when I saw the images in TV, you know, these people have been given a burden, the burden to endure disaster. We have been given a gift, the gift of being spared from disaster. So how could we know, not use our gift to lift their burden? So quickly, a group of volunteers, we quickly organized ourselves. Actually, it was not even a group. I said, I'm going to Haiti. I, I tweeted, I'm going to Haiti. People told me, don't go tomorrow. Give us one day to get supplies. And all of a sudden, I get a phone call from someone who says, I'm going with you. And boom, in 
24 hours, 48 hours, we had a group of people going to Haiti. We had vehicles, we had resources, we had everything. And we headed to Haiti. I tried to contact the international organizations to, to put ourselves in uh, their service. They said, we're not ready to go to Haiti yet. It's too early. We don't think it's safe. So we go there. We found chaos in Haiti. Now, we didn't find chaos among the victims. We found chaos among the relief organizations. We found chaos among the distribution of resources. We found chaos among the delivery of the goods that the world had sent to Haiti. The world had responded. Millions and millions of dollars of supplies were being sent. And we found our wall of revelations. This is a cardboard orphanage outside Port-au-Prince Airport. A cardboard orphanage. There are 30 kids living in those boxes in there. Now, if you look there, that's the airport. There's a wall, and that's the airport. Millions of dollars in supplies. Millions of dollars in vehicles. Hundreds of volunteers in there. However, the civil organizations had no, no, no authorizations to leave their compound, the safety of their compound inside the airport, and the military had no clearance to bring civilians with them. So no one was able to drive 300 meters across the gates of the airport and bring supplies to the kids, bring supplies to people who had open wounds, who had broken ribs, broken legs outside the airport. That is how puzzling it was. No one was able to run the last mile. So we decided that we would do it. That's how Relief 2.0 was born. Relief 2.0 is the practice of deploying independent units in the field, supported by mobile technologies and social networks, to fill the gaps left by bureaucracy and top-down hierarchies. We use independent units of local stakeholders and foreign volunteers with their own money, with their own vehicle, who know where to go, who don't have to ask anyone for permission, and they will always make their own assessment. Every five minutes, every moment, they will make their own assessment, and they will run the last mile. We will use mobile technologies, SMS. I would send, I have a kid here who needs insulin. I have a kid here who needs something. I would send an SMS. Someone would receive an SMS. They would retweet it to the world. It would be retweeted and retweeted and retweeted, put it on Facebook until half an hour later we would get an answer. You can go get some insulin at this place. I don't want a car. I brought dozens of trucks to Haiti. I ride a bicycle every day. All my belongings fit in a suitcase. I once tweeted, I need to get out of Haiti. I have an appointment tomorrow at 8 a.m. and they're going to close the border. I'm not going to make it. In less than 30 minutes, I had two shoppers landing down to pick me up. I could actually decide which one was nicer to go. That's how efficient it is. And I don't belong to any organization. That's how Relief 2.0 works. But they ask us, but what is it that you do there? I tell them, well, sometimes we just run errands. But these are errands that save lives. That's what we do. It, we just run the last mile. There has been uh, some criticism by large organizations about, you know, these independent units in the field, they actually get in the way. Or they might be doing good, but they're not coordinated. Yes, we are. It's just that we don't believe in coordination through centralization. We believe in coordination through communication. That's what we believe in. Everything we do is transparent. Everything we do is out there. Correct us, fix us, join us. You know where we're going. You know where we're going to be. You know what we're doing. Everyone knows because it's open. There's no secret meeting. There's no, clo there's no closed door clusters meeting. Everything is out in the open. Everyone can join and add value. Everyone. Here we have two kids from Japan talking to a journalist in Stanford and another journalist in uh, Rio de Janeiro to see how, how we should condu con conduct the interviews of people in Japan. Everyone has something to add. One of the most uh, valuable people we had in our team were two, actually there were two, two mothers who were living in Louisiana. And they actually, they, they, their kids had gone off to college, so they had all the time in the world. They, was, they were in their computer 24 hours a day, monitoring tweets, monitoring everything, and making sure that, we, that the dots were connected. They didn't have to leave their home. 
and they didn't even have to send one dollar. And they did an amazing job of supporting the operations. You know, because the best team is not the team made of by the best people. It's the team that makes its members better people, that enables them to do more. I see amazing people walking around like regular, like regular people, just like in the movie of the kid that sees dead people. Well, I see amazing people. This is Mrs. Oikawa. Two weeks after the earthquake, she reopened her factory and started to produce jeans and rehired all her workers. Less than a month after the earthquake. This is Dr. Nobuyuki. He found me wandering around in Shinomaki in Japan, and he came to help me. He said, what do you need? I asked for directions. He gave me directions. Only later, I found out that he had lost his wife in the tsunami. When I came back, less than a month later, he had reopened his, his private practice office. And when I asked for a picture, he, insist, he insisted to include a picture of his wife. They are people. Everyone has something to add. Find your superpower. You have it. Might, you might be a people's person, you might be a dog's person, you might be a Twitter person, you might be a Facebook person, you might be an email person, you might be a gossip person, whatever. Find your superpower and then join a league of superheroes and exercise your power. The best part of growing up is that you get to live out your childhood dreams. Okay, you don't get to be an engineer, you don't get, the, sorry, you don't get to be a policeman or a fireman or an astronaut. But, you know, even without the shiny uniform, you get to travel places and you get to serve other people. Remember that. Always come to serve people, not to save them. People don't need saving. They need to be enabled. There's a big problem right now with the disaster relief, and it's the course of exclusion of local, local stakeholders and displacement of local capacity. Natural disasters do not create refugees. They are survivors, brave people who survive disaster. Now, they create survivors. It is the conventional relief system that creates refugees. We confine these people in these camps, and then we have to feed them. We tell them, they stand in line, we'll feed you. Lunch is at noon. Why? These people can cook. They have two hands. They, they are mothers. They are fathers. They, there are probably chefs in there, people who, who used to own restaurants, so they can cook. We don't have to be feeding them. Why do we need to minimize them? Because who are the disaster survivors? You know, the disaster survivors are people like us. Before the earthquake, before the tsunami, they own restaurants, they own businesses, they were business people, they had works, they, has, they have skills. Why do we want to limit their skills and their capacity? Disasters destroy the physical infrastructure. They do not destroy, they do not destroy the social infrastructure. This is a group of people in Haiti playing soccer two weeks after the earthquake because they were not given anything to do inside their refugee camps. Playing soccer. They have two legs, two, uh, two arms. You come to them, they would join us and we would go out and spend the entire day working. But the international organizations would not look at them. We would flood the area with volunteers. So that is a main problem we have, the exclusion of locals in disaster recovery. That's why we're creating markets of hope, to enable, to enable disaster survivors as entrepreneurs before they are turned into refugees by the conventional relief system. It's a global marketplace of products and services from disaster areas and disadvantaged communities to provide disaster recovery with dignity, inclusion, generation of wealth and opportunities to take advantage of the competitive advantage of local innovation and global entrepreneurship. You know, the best thing is that what makes us different makes us better. That's what allows us to compete to in, big, in big markets. We might be a small country, but what makes us be different makes us better. You, only you can think like a person from Turkey. Only I can think like a person from the Caribbean. No one in Silicon Valley will think, think like you or think like me. That's my advantage. So join us to have an impact in people's lives, and together we can change the world.